want to say good morning to you all. My name's Sean. I'm the lead pastor here at Harbor Church. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm going to begin by reading our text this morning that I'll be preaching from. We're back in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. It'll be up on the screen, but follow along as I read. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you are strained like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I said, this morning we're back in 1 Peter. We jump back into our sermon series, working through this great book on living hope. And today we come to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. We're going to spend some more time there this morning, but I think it'll be helpful uh, to begin with dealing with a few landmines this morning. There's a lot of challenges in this text today. By landmines, any of you ever play the game Minesweeper? You know that game? It's an old one a little bit. I remember like Windows 95, click around the computer screen, all that sort of stuff. I was never very good at that game. But you're supposed to click these spots and find where the landmines are and work your way around them and don't actually click on them lest you blow up and you die. Today, a lot of landmines in our text. Submission, masters and slaves. Oh my, what do we have to do with these things? There are landmines here. And so I feel like this morning we need to tread lightly and maneuver around some things here and get some objections out of the way because I can already hear them coming as we come to this text. And I say that because I feel if we don't deal with them, you'll be stuck thinking about slaves and masters rather than what Peter is trying to really tell us here in this text. And why are there landmines? It's because of our disposition towards submission and masters and slavery. We live in a society that is increasingly seeing the world in two categories of people, the oppressor and the oppressed. Those who are under authority are in the oppressed category, and those who are in authority are the oppressors. This is the worldview heavily influenced by critical theory, working its way through all of the cultural institutions into the thinking of everyday people. Truly, it is a religious worldview. It frames how people think as it tries to provide answers to some of the most fundamental questions. Who am I? Why do we have these problems in the world? What am I to do about them? What is the vision for the future? These are really religious questions that critical theory, among other things, try to answer. Who am I? Critical theory might say you are either one who is oppressed, which is most likely the identity we assume for ourselves, or you're an oppressor. Why do these problems exist in the world? Well, it's because of systemic issues whereby the oppressors have created systems and structures to keep those under oppression. That's why there's problems in the world. Well, what are we to do about them? Fight the oppression that is there. Pull them down from their positions of power. Humble them. Elevate the oppressed. Subjugate the oppressors. And allow them to be now oppressed in the system. And what is the vision of the future? Well, it's a world where we flip the script on all oppression that is out there. I say this is a religious view. There's even a sacred canon of books to read. There's a narrative to adopt for your life. There's even priests and priestesses proselytizing, promulgating this religion. And they've been very effective in spreading this thinking throughout our society, throughout culture. And this thinking says that all authority is oppression and therefore we must rebel against our oppressors. And so for many, there are landmines that blow up as soon as we begin to talk about submission to authority. And I'm not saying there is no oppression in this world today. 
only that we're predisposed to be quite anti-authoritarian and we chafe at the thought of submission because submission equals oppression in our minds. So immediately, when we talk about submission to authority, it's a difficult subject. Then on top of that, we also have the reality of the horrors of our history being so connected to slavery. It's impossible to talk about things like race or slavery without having in mind the transatlantic slave trade and the wicked practice of owning other human beings as property. That immediately comes to the fore of our minds. It's like how you can't talk about the Nazis without the horrors of Auschwitz being right there. So we've gotta be careful how we talk about things like slavery even slavery that was practiced thousands of years ago on the other side of the world. Then on top of those things, you also have people today trying to poke holes in Christianity, claiming that it promotes this practice of chattel slavery. There's a person in our church, told me of a conversation with a friend. A friend was not a believer. Their main objection was to Christianity. Uh, Their main objection to Christianity is that it promotes slavery. Have you ever heard that objection before? And ever heard people talk about that sort of thing? They are argue hard, claiming that the Bible promotes slavery. And since now we're so enlightened and can see the moral horrors of slavery, how morally repugnant it was, so they say, then how can we follow an ancient text that promotes such a practice? If you've never heard that, trust me, you will. It's growing in popularity, and I'm fairly certain as you talk with people, that will come up someday. So for a lot of reasons, there are landmines here this morning as we begin our time in our text. But for a few minutes, I wanna try to deal with some of those landmines because like I said, if I don't, I think we'll miss the message of 1 Peter here. I wanna help us think about the Bible uh, and how it talks about slavery and masters and authority because Peter here speaks directly to slaves in the ancient world and tells them, slaves, submit to your masters. Be subject to your masters. The word servants here is the same word for slaves. We just like to clean that up and say servants rather than slaves. To be subject is to submit. Slaves, submit to your masters. Is this the Bible teaching that slavery is a good thing, condoning slavery? How should we think about slavery in the Bible and submission? Well, first, I want us to acknowledge that slavery has been a universal institution throughout human history. To my knowledge, and I'm not the end-all be-all, but to my knowledge, there has never been a time in human history among any people group in any part of the world where slavery has not existed in some form. It has just been universally practiced since the beginning. That is, at least up until the 19th century, right? So as far back as we can go historically, there has been slavery. And that's not to excuse it, but to simply say that the reality of history is that slavery existed, not just unique to the Americas or to the West, or to the Bible, or to the Jews, or anything. It's been universally practiced throughout time. And slavery does still exist in some form or another in our day. The reality is that life thousands of years ago was much more difficult than it was today. Today, we are talking about AI robots taking over production of goods so that people will never have to work in this life anymore. And universal income, and all sorts of things like that. We live in such a prosperous age But in ancient times, the only way to survive was to have a huge labor force that was relatively and very, very cheap to create resources to make uh, society function. And again, that's not a moral justification of slavery. It's simply to say the reason why groups of people turned to this practice was they could get a lot of labor for almost no cost and increase their profits significantly. Or another reason for slavery especially between warring groups, is that you didn't want your enemies to rise up and come and steal your resources. Resources were scarce, so you didn't want anyone to come and steal your stuff. So you'd conquer a foe, you'd put them in slavery so that they could not rise up and rebel against you in the future. So when the Bible, written by human authors over two millennia, writes about these things, inevitably it has to interact with this practice of slavery already universally practiced. Now, Some people say that the Bible condones slavery. The logic here is something like this. The Bible never explicitly abolishes the practice. Therefore, God must condone that very practice. That's just faulty logic. Just because something is not condemned does not mean it is therefore approved. Okay, here's the thing. 
I don't know that I've ever told my children, I have two young girls, 10 and 12. I don't think I've ever told my children, do not pick up a gun and shoot somebody with it. But because I haven't told them, that does not mean I approve of them doing that thing, right? The logic is faulty there. Just because I don't condemn something doesn't necessarily mean that I approve of that practice, right? You track with me there? So just because the Bible never explicitly abolishes the practice doesn't mean that God condones it. So what does the Bible say about slavery? Well, I heard Christian apologist Frank Tourette give a really concise summary of the Bible's teaching on slavery once. He was in a debate. His opponent was attacking God and the validity of the scriptures. And his opponent said something like, the creator of the universe wrote a book and he couldn't even get it right on slavery. So Tourette, about 45 seconds, just, I think, demolished this guy's argument. He put up a PowerPoint. If you know anything about Frank Tourette, he's got a PowerPoint for everything. So he pulls up this PowerPoint real quick, and again, in about 45 seconds, gives us a really concise summary of the Bible's view on slavery. Here's what Turek said. Again, 45 seconds. Point number one, Old Testament slavery was not race-based forced servitude. It was a voluntary means of working off debt or keeping captives from Western rebellion. Point two, slave trading is condemned in the Bible, both in the Old and New Testament, and it is punishable by death in the Old Testament. Point three, the Bible teaches that all are made in the image of God. Slave and master are equally human, equally protected, equally one in Christ. Again, Old and New Testament affirm that. Jesus said, I came to set the captives free and the Bible's main goal is not social reform, but spiritual redemption. Though redemption often achieves reform. I think it's a helpful summary. It's helpful understanding what the Bible would teach about slavery. And so in five points, in 45 seconds, Tarek deals with some of the Bible's teaching on slavery. And I hope you find that helpful as well. Now we have to admit, there are some passages in the Old Testament that suggest how Israelites were to own and manage their slaves. But it was always to mandate care for slaves, not abuse of them. And though the apostles never explicitly abolish or call for the abolishment of slavery, there are certainly ways in which they undermine that practice. The seeds of upheaval are sown in the New Testament. The very seeds that it was Christian abolitionists in the 19th century that they read and understood that led them to abolish the practice. So for people to say the Bible condones slavery is just to be ignorant about what scripture actually teaches there. Yet when talking to people about this issue, especially unbelievers, I think it may be more fruitful rather than to dive into the particulars and the nuance of every single passage that talks about it, it's just a point back to what God intended in the first place. Sometimes maybe it's helpful to say, yeah, slavery did exist, but that was not God's intention in the beginning. What do we see in Genesis 1 and 2? That man and woman are there created equally in God's image. That all people are made in the image of God. That all of them have the same ontological status, the same status of being, There's no people or nation or tribe or sex that is superior in one way to another. All are equal image bearers of God and all are to be equal partners in carrying out God's plan in this world. And we have a category for explaining why things went the way they did. It's sin. Genesis 3 onward, everything is broken. Contrary to what critical theory would say, the ultimate problem is not systemic oppression, it is sin. And the solution is not to bring down the oppressors, it's to find redemption in Jesus. So in this conversation about slavery, it may be most fruitful just to sidestep the issue of what the Bible teaches or doesn't teach and point back to God's original design for all things. Just go back and say, look, sin has marred this world, but God intended that all of us would be equal image bearers, living righteously and doing justice. And as Christians, we all should be committed towards working towards redemption and reconciliation in the things that sin has broken. So, slavery was never God's intention or design. And having probably stepped on maybe more landmines than I dodged there, uh, what are we to do with this command from Peter? Back to our text, 1 Peter 2, verse 18. Let me remind you of what it says. Servants, Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. 
What are we to do with this command from Peter? Now, obviously, slavery doesn't exist in our context like it did in his day. That's not to say that there are not slaves in places of our world today. There are. There may even be slaves in our own community that we don't want to talk about. But in our everyday experience, we don't see it or experience it or live it like the, Peter, the people in Peter's day did. So what relevance does this have for us today? This is where some will turn to the next closest parallel in our world, which I think is the employee-employer relationship. In one sense, slaves were employees and masters were employers, except there is an obvious and glaring difference between us and them. Today, our employment is at will, right? Like we can either endure or we can complain or we can just quit and leave our place of employment. For those slaves, there was no such recourse. Their options were endure their harsh treatment or probably face death. Now, there's value in thinking about slaves and masters and employees and employers, especially for those who feel enslaved to their own employer. Maybe it's not a great situation that you're in. Maybe you can't quit because you need the work and have no other prospects in front of you. And maybe your boss is a difficult taskmaster or they don't compensate you fairly. Or maybe they make you work weird hours or do things that bruise your conscience. So there may be some ways in which slaves and masters do map onto employees and employers today. And I do think there's some legitimate application from our text to that arena. But I think that's kind of a secondary one. I think where Peter wants to take us this morning is in a different direction because I think Peter's getting at something even more fundamental than masters, slaves, employees, employers. What Peter is getting at here is how we live in submission to and even suffer under what may be unjust authority. Certainly this is true in the context of slaves where it was necessary to live under the unjust authority of their masters. But may we broaden that out just a little bit to all authority. How do we live today under unjust authority? I think that's what Peter's trying to get at for us. And why do I say that? Let me show you why I say that. Verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Now, Peter probably doesn't need to tell the slaves to, who have good and kind and gentle masters to be subject to them. That's just a given. It would be easy to subject yourself to a kind master. But this command is necessary for those who find themselves under the authority of the unjust. Live in submission to your masters, even those who are unjust, Peter says. And Peter's writing this letter to give encouragement to those who are suffering under these unjust masters. This idea of unjust suffering comes up over and over again. Verse 18, 19, 20, 21, and 23. It's a big part of this text, as we will see. Peter's trying to help those who live in this subjection to these authorities, trying to help them navigate how to live in submission to them while enduring suffering especially when suffering for doing good at the hands of unjust authority. Is that applicable to us today? Can you think of any situations where one might suffer for doing good at the hands of unjust authority? How about people in the military? We have some military people here this morning. How about people who have to submit to a command that they might consider unjust or might bruise their conscience? How about those who work for the state or federal government who are required to toe the line on policies which are against God's law? How about teachers having to teach a curriculum that exists contrary, exalts things that are contrary to God's revelation? How about a spouse having to live under the authoritarian rule of a tyrant or a dictator in the home? Well, some of these are minor injustices. Some are larger in the grand scheme of things, but the point still stands this text may have more relevance for us today than first meets the eye. There's another landmine here. Let me address it. The Bible does not teach that we are duty-bound to live under abuse. To those in slavery in the ancient world, the apostle Paul says, if you can gain your freedom, do so. That is a good thing to do. So do not stay a slave and suffer for it if you don't have to. And to those being physically hurt, or abused by people in authority, you should rightly flee that situation. 
You should speak out. You should get help. And if that's you here this morning, if you're in that situation, then come talk to me afterwards because we need to help you. No one is morally obligated to suffer injustice. And in fact, the Bible would call on Christians to help those who are being abused and to work to end that injustice. Yet for those who couldn't flee, such as a slave stuck in his master's household, how are they to live in a way that is godly? Or maybe for those who choose to say, choose to stay, how are they to continue to do so? What I wanna argue from our text this morning is that we can submit We can submit ourselves and we can endure suffering for doing good as we entrust ourselves to God. Now, I don't say we have to endure, but God has given us all that we need to endure. And if we are forced to submit and to endure, then God will meet us there and supply everything we need, everything that is necessary to sustain us through it. So again, my argument from 1 Peter here is that we can submit and we can endure suffering for doing good as we entrust ourselves to God. So Peter gives us a command in verse 18. Slaves, submit to your masters, even the unjust ones. And then he goes on to give us two reasons why, two reasons how we can endure. The blessing of God in verses 19 through 20 and the example of Jesus in verse 21. So that's what we're gonna see. Submission to unjust authority and why the blessing of God the example of Jesus. Let's notice a few other things here about submission of slaves to their masters. Look one more time at verse 18. Now, here Peter tells the slaves how they are to submit. How? How is there to submit? Slaves, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Now, the word respect here is actually the word for fear, with all fear. So, are slaves supposed to submit because they live in fear of their masters? Undoubtedly, there are wicked masters who want their slaves to live in perpetual fear and thus obey them without question. But I do not think that's what Peter has in mind. They are to submit with fear, but fearing God, not fearing men. The exact same word for fear is in verse 17, just one verse before. Look back, verse 17 of chapter 2. What does Peter say there? Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Then he moves into verse 18, and Peter says, submit with all fear. He has just said, fear God. Now he says, live with fear. And so I think Peter has in mind, not the fear of men, but the fear of God. These slaves are to submit to their masters, not in the fear of man, but in fear and respect of God. I think that's further proven in verse 19. Peter goes on, for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, not mindful of your masters, but mindful of God, when there's sorrows while suffering unjustly. He does not say be mindful of your masters, rather be mindful of the Lord. And remember, even how Peter opened this entire section on submission and authority. Back in verse 13, we saw this a few weeks ago. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. We are to be subject to every human human institution, not for their sake, but for the Lord's sake. We are to live as a people who are free. We've been set free in Christ, as we saw a few weeks ago. Being freed from Christ, though, we ought to live as slaves to God, servants of God. And what God then does, having freed us from our masters, is he sends us back into the world, back into these human institutions to live in submission to every God-given authority. But now, not for their sake, but for God's sake. That's crucial to see. That is what Peter is telling us in this whole section. He's showing us that we're to live in submission, whether to emperors or to masters, for God's sake, in the fear of God. Slaves who are free in Christ are nonetheless to submit to their masters because they revere God because God has sent them back in after having pulled them out, giving them freedom. And so Peter says, slaves, submit, but not because you fear those masters, but rather because you fear God. 
And because you fear God, you can submit yourself even to the unjust treatment of your master. But that's no easy task, is it? And Peter knows it. To call anyone to willingly suffer and to continue doing the very things which brought suffering upon them in the first place, man, that is a tall order. And only the calling and sustaining power of God can help in those types of situations. And now why are these slaves suffering unjustly? They were suffering for doing good. They were doing good works and they were suffering because of it. That's clear in verses 19 and 20. Look towards the middle of verse 20 with me. Peter goes on and he says, but if when you do good, when you do good and you suffer for it, you endure. Do you see the connection there? Peter is saying these slaves are suffering for doing good. When you do good and suffer for it, you endure. They were enduring sorrow while suffering unjustly and they were suffering for doing good, the very good things that God called them to do. Now, Peter admits it is no injustice for doing sin. That's a given, right? We should readily accept the consequences of our actions when we sin. We get what we deserve in those moments. But if, when you suffer for doing good, you endure, well, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Whatever the good is that they were doing, their masters were punishing them for it. And here's the reality, friends. Doing good works, doing the good works of God may bring suffering your way. In speaking of suffering, Peter here is not talking about chronic illness or the tragedies of life. Those things are suffering, yes, but this here is different. He's talking about active hostility and persecution from other people specifically for doing the good works that God has called us to. Have any of you ever, any of you ever experienced suffering for doing good works? I'm not talking about this idea that no good deed goes unpunished, that pithy saying or whatever. I'm talking about active blowback when we do the good works of God. Now, we're probably not gonna get pushback from the community as we care for the poor or give food to the homeless or help that single mom who's having a hard time making ends meet. That's because we live in a culture that has still been shaped by the Christian ethic. And most people agree those are good things to do and would applaud our efforts in them. But culture is shifting. And so we should prepare for pushback as our culture's definition of what is good moves contrary to the Bible's definition of what is good. For example, we can and probably should expect some level of pushback when we stand for objective truth and we stand for those truths that are no longer seen as good today. When we define marriage the way God does, not the way the world does. Or when we go and pray for families going in and out of Planned Parenthood downtown Olympia, that prayer is seen as an offense. That prayer is seen as a hostile thing and we should expect pushback when we do that when we insist that children should be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and desire that they be taught a biblical worldview in their schooling. Or when we skip those kids' sports tournaments because we value and prioritize gathering with our brothers and sisters in Christ over our hobbies and activities. These are good things which are growing increasingly out of step with our world. And it's not hard to see how suffering may come both now and maybe in the future. And hopefully you won't be beaten for those things. But Peter's encouragement is to keep on doing those good things even unto suffering. And that's one of the shocks of this passage. Do good and suffer for it. And do not stop doing those good deeds, even if it causes you further suffering in this life. And submit yourselves to the authorities God has placed over you, Peter says, even if they're the ones causing your suffering. That's what Peter seems to be saying in these verses to these slaves and to us. Do good, even if you suffer for it. Now here's a, now here's a tension. Does submission mean blind obedience? Presumably, these slaves were instruct, instructed to stop doing these good deeds that they were doing. Presumably, these masters were beating them, trying to get them to stop. And so does Peter say, 
Well, stop doing good if you're being beaten for it. No, it's the exact opposite. Peter says, being mindful of God, endure the sufferings that come as you do good, for this is a gracious thing in God's sight. So submission here is clearly not obedience to those earthly masters. Otherwise, Peter would say, well, if they're telling you to stop, then you should stop doing those good things that God has called you to do. Rather, Peter demands our obedience to our heavenly master, even if it causes us suffering in this life. That's what he means in verses 19 and 20. Submit to your earthly masters, but realize you have a greater master who is in heaven to whom you owe your highest allegiances. We must first obey him and do what he has called us to do, which is to keep on doing these good things, even if it is costly. But that's hard. Friends, that is hard, right? Like, who wants to do that? Honestly, who wants to suffer for doing good? That is so unjust, so not righteous. Really? That's what we're supposed to continue doing? Continue suffering? Maybe even experiencing physical pain? And live in submission? Really, Peter? That's what you're calling us to? That's hard. But yes, I think that's what Peter is saying to us. It's what the Bible is showing us. We are not to shy away from doing good because we might suffer for it. And catch this. Rather, we are to do good because we will suffer for it. We do good even when it is costly. And this is the radical call of the Christian life. Christians are not to shy away from living in righteousness even when it is costly for us. So the question is, what kind of people will we be? Will we be this kind of people? This kind of people who will be scoffed at, mocked, called names because we continue doing good in this world? Will we be the kind of people who will endure the hardships, both physically and financially or in other ways, to radically love our neighbors? Will we be known as a people who care for the oppressed and the widows and the orphans and the refugees and the poor and the unborn and seek justice on their behalf, even if we're reviled by those for those things on the left and on the right? We be a people willing and ready and able to endure suffering for doing good and still be willing to subject ourselves to further mistreatment, even punishment for it. This is the call of 1 Peter chapter 2. It is not easy, but it is our calling nonetheless. We are called to continue doing good even when suffering comes because Peter makes that point explicit. In verse 21, Look at what Peter says. For to this, you have been called. For to this suffering, for to this suffering for doing good, you have been called. We've been called to do good, even if it leads to our suffering. Well, how are we gonna do that? How is that even possible? Peter better have some pretty doggone good reasons if he's calling us to live this way, and we're gonna need a lot of help along the way. And so we need to see Peter's reasoning why. Why is it that we are con to continue doing this good works, these good works, even if it leads to our suffering? And Peter gives us two reasons why. The blessing of God and the example of Jesus. First, to the blessing of God. We see this in verses 19 and 20. Look there with me. Notice the phrase, this is a gracious thing. Peter says, for this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Skipping ahead just a little bit. But if when you do good and you suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Peter says to endure suffering for good is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Peter here speaks of the blessings of God that come to those who suffer for doing good. That's what he means by gracious thing. It is the blessing of God. And I think Peter got that idea from Jesus himself. Turn to Luke chapter six, verses 32 through 36, if you want. It'll also be on the screen here, but Jesus says something similar. Luke chapter six, Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. 
If you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. But love your enemies and do good. Lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. Who are our enemies? Those who cause us suffering. Those aren't our friends, those are enemies, right? Yet Jesus says, love them, do good to them, and what will be the result? Your reward will be great. This, I think, is the gracious thing Peter's talking about. You can suffer for doing good knowing that God will reward you. God will repay you. There is not one ounce of good done in this world that God does not see and that God will not one day honor. And so love your enemies and do good knowing that your reward will be great. Do good. Do not repay evil, but bless. This is what Peter tells us later on in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He says, do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, so that you may obtain a blessing. Do you see that there as well? What Peter is telling us is that we are to do good even to those who might persecute us or do evil to us, so that we might obtain a blessing. The reason Peter gives for continuing to do good, even when it brings suffering, is that we would obtain the blessing of God. And the blessing of God is coming for those who do good, friends, even when it is costly. It may be in the near term. It may cost us in the near term. I'm sorry, it may be that blessing comes in the near term. Or it may be in the end that we will receive a blessing. But ultimately, we need to remember that one day, those who are in Christ, they will receive an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God when you endure suffering for doing good. And we have to know God will repay you. There's our hope in the midst of suffering. It is a gracious thing in the sight of God, knowing that God will bless, that God will repay us one day. And the second reason he gives why we should suffer for doing good is just as profound, I believe. We are to continue in this way because we follow the one who suffered for us. Look at verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Not only will the blessing of God come, but our great savior and example has already endured suffering on our behalf. He has already suffered doing the ultimate good. And now we're merely following in his footsteps. And what did Jesus do? Our great example, what did he do? Jesus, the suffering servant, he went to the cross in our place for our sins. Jesus, our substitute and sacrifice, went to bear our sins in his body on the tree. Look how Peter reminds us what Christ has already done for us. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He bore him... He, bore, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep, you were like strange sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. What was the example of Jesus? It was to suffer in his body doing the ultimate good of forgiving our sins so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. This was the great work of Christ on the cross. He went in our place for our sins. Jesus willingly suffered. He endured. He continued to do what was good in the eyes of God, even though it caused him deep pain immense anguish and sorrow, hardship like we cannot fathom. It cost him everything. 
If ever someone suffered willingly under unjust authority for doing only that which was good, it was seen in Jesus. And Peter reminds us, by his wounds, through his suffering, we have been healed. We all, like sheep, are going astray, but now our great shepherd has brought us back to God. This is what Jesus endured for you. Friend, you may see the world today in terms of oppressor and oppressed, and you might identify as one who is oppressed, but the reality is that all of us were oppressors of Jesus. It was our sin that caused Jesus to go to the cross, and he willingly went there, taking our oppression, taking on the oppression of the cross to deal with our sin. None of us is righteous to suffer like Christ. All of us are like the wicked master, beating the slave for doing what is right. Only the one we beat, only the one that we beat and whip is Jesus. And this is our sin. This is what God should have done to us because of our sin. And yet Jesus did the ultimate good and he suffered for it. He suffered for you so that through faith in him, you might be healed, that you might be forgiven, that you might receive the blessings of God. This was the example of Jesus that we are to follow. He suffered more than any of us will ever know doing good. And if he endured so much for us, what is but a little suffering for doing good in our own lives? Jesus suffered for doing good so that we can endure following in his footsteps. And how is it that Jesus was able to do this? How is it that he suffered as he did? Well, Peter tells us in the middle of verse, or at the end of verse 23, he tells us that Jesus continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Throughout all of it, Jesus was continually entrusting himself to God. He trusted his life. He trusted his body. He trusted his soul, all of himself to God. Jesus suffered at the hands of those who were radically unjust, yet he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly, who is perfectly just. And Jesus never lost hope or faith in God. This is how Jesus endured. He continually entrusted himself to God. And friends, this is how we too can endure the sufferings which may come as we do good in this world. We don't find any strength in ourselves. It's not that we double down and resolve in our efforts. No, we entrust ourselves to God who is the ultimate judge, the just judge, and the one who will one day bring ultimate justice, redeeming and restoring and making all things right. We are to entrust ourselves to God like Jesus. And in doing so, that enables us to endure suffering for doing good. So as I conclude this morning, what have we seen here? Peter exhorts slaves to keep on doing what is good, even though they may be suffering for us for it. And he calls them to continue on in willing submission, even to unjust masters, not in fear of them, but rather in the fear of God. But Peter gives them hope in the midst of their sufferings. It is a gracious thing in the sight of God when one suffers for doing good. So hold on to the hope of the blessing that is to come, my friends. God is good. God is not blind to our sufferings and God will repay each one someday according to what he has done. And for those who suffer for doing good, we can look forward in hope with eager expectation as we endure the sufferings of this life, knowing that one day God will repay, that God will bring his blessings, knowing that one day we will receive an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for us. And we are to look to Jesus who suffered in our place. We look to him, remembering his example of willing submission, of ultimate suffering for doing the ultimate good. We are to remember that he went to the cross at the hands of unjust sinners like us, and yet he went there for us 
And he was able to endure such suffering because he entrusted himself to the God who judges justly. And so brothers and sisters, may the words of Peter and the example of Christ be of great encouragement to us this morning. May we continue all the more doing what is good in the sight of God, even when it is not easy. And may we look to the blessing of God that he will bring through that. And may we remember to follow in the example of Christ who suffered so much for us as we entrust ourselves fully to God. Let's pray. Lord God, there are difficult things for us to wrestle with in the text as we see it in your word this morning. This is not an easy call for us, Lord, to continue doing what is good and right and just according to your word, knowing that it might be costly for us. God, the world does not love the things that you love. It does not agree with what you say is right. And yet, we are your servants, and so we must obey you. It is you we must follow in your example. And we need your help to do these things you've called us to do, the things that are hard, the things that are uncomfortable, the things that may lead to our suffering. But God, we thank you that you didn't leave us on our own. You have given us reasons and shown us how, and you've gone before us to lead the way by your example. And so God, we are thankful for Jesus and his suffering for us, that he did the ultimate good on our behalf. We're so thankful that you are the one who judges justly, that no injustice in this world will you let go, nor any wrong that is done that will not be repaid. And so God, help us to trust you, to entrust ourselves to you, the one who judges justly. And help us to live as you've called us to live, that we might be all the more like Jesus, following in his footsteps. Help us to follow him in the power of your spirits. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.